Hello everyone, I thought I'd do another video um, just based on a request that I had uh, from a lady who's sort of ventured into the world of making her own stitch capes from scratch. Um, it's normally something that I'd only really talk about in my workshops but as quite a lot of them have been cancelled um, <laughs> I thought I'd do a workshop from the kitchen table. Uh, so I'm going to hopefully talk today about how I come up with the landscapes, how I put together some fabrics um, and how your stitch capes end up looking finished and balanced and like a landscape. Um, so these are just a few that I've done. Some of them are already made up uh, and can be purchased as kits. So we've got Bluebell Garden, Ladybug Valley, Woolly Dale, Fire Flower and In the Spring. Um, these other ones were ones that I just made made for fun really. This one was the made out of scraps from my scrap box. This one was a little one that I made uh, as a challenge um, from a workshop. Um, I'd put together lots of little tiny packs, these are only 10 centimetres, uh, with four fabrics in each, uh, and I came across one. Uh, so I thought, well, I challenged myself to, to use one and, and see what I can make. Um, but there's lots of different colours you can use. It's literally whatever you have, whatever you want to create. Um, if you've got any animal fabrics, that's uh, usually a very very cute thing to do and um, but you can put trees in it suns in it whatever you want there is no right or wrong um, so you can play as much or as little as you like um, so just to get started let's stack some of these out of the way I've started framing them in their hoops um, so that it's easy for me to transport around to shows and to workshops but actually uh, if anyone follows me kind of on Instagram or Facebook you see that I've been over over the recent lockdown, I've been actually putting them up in their hoops on my bedroom wall and kind of created a, a hoop wall, which actually looks really lovely and slightly different from um, your normal framed square rectangular uh, art pieces of work. I tend to use wooden hoops rather than plastic hoops, uh, which is more personal preference. I prefer the way they look and I prefer the way that you can tighten them and loosen them however you want to hold them. Some people like their hoops to be slightly baggy, others like them quite tight. Um, I'm personally in the tight brigade. We like it drum tight. So these are just a couple of different brands as well because um, I ran out of one. So this is the LBC brand. Uh, I'm not quite sure what brand this is. It's a new one that I discovered. Uh, it's not called, I think it's called Vor portal or something like that but it doesn't really matter they're both do the same thing the only difference in these cases is that the hoop screws are slightly different um, in shape and, and length but <clears throat> it doesn't really make much of a difference uh, in terms of size if you're just starting out as a beginner and you want something you can easily um, complete finish pick up put down whatever you want uh, this is a 12 centimeter so a 5 inch and this one is a 15 centimeter so a, a 6 inch both of them are quite nice to hold and um, you can take them travelling, I stay with these on the bus, in the car, um, I've even taken them on a plane and uh, stitched all the way to Iceland um, which was really lovely. Um, so I'll see if I can do a couple of um, different hoop demonstrations in putting together hoops just with the two different sizes. I'll start with the, with the 15. This is the first time actually I've used one of these myself. I've usually only supply them in my shop, so let's test it, see if, how well it is. But I've also got a couple of different weights of calico um, just to demonstrate to you. So this one, I don't know if you can see, uh, is quite a light, light weight. It's not um, the lightest weight. You can't. There are lots of different weights of calico, and they're all sort of used for different things. So whether you're a um, fashion designer and you use them for your maquettes, your mock-ups of your um, costumes uh, or, or uh, if you're using them as a backing. I really like them because they're just a bog standard, plain cotton weave. Um, it's really inexpensive to buy and it'll take a lot of beating. I put a lot of embroidery um, onto these hoops so it'll, it'll always stand up to the, the test of the embroidery. It doesn't stretch. Um, and it doesn't 
depending on the weight and the brand, it doesn't actually fray madly. Obviously, it's going a little bit here. These are just scraps that I've had lying around the house um, that are left over. Um, this is a smaller square, save that for the 12. Uh, and this one is a slightly chunkier. Um, this is new, I've just bought this from a new supplier uh, and it's actually called Good Quality Calico, so I'm expecting good things. Uh, hopefully it will live up to its namesake. Um, you'll notice I haven't actually ironed, uh, and this is a reject I think, because it's a bit grubby on the back, um, so I can't put that in a kit, but I haven't ironed. And that's because once you stretch everything in your hoop, properly, the creases will start to go and as you layer the fabrics over, obviously you won't see the backing fabric anyway, um, but I don't even iron the, the face fabrics um, because as you sew you kind of iron the creases out, obviously if you do want to iron that's absolutely fine, I can't um, stand ironing personally, so I try and avoid it as much as possible. Um, so what I'm doing is I've put my calico into the hoop first um, and this is so that when I get my pattern fabrics and start layering up my seam to, to create my uh, lovely picture. Um, I can move them around, I can still um, readjust them, play with them, but the back's all ready to go. So even when I've cut my fabrics and I've layered them down, I can sew them straight down onto the fabric, onto a tight background, um, without having to worry about things being creased or having to uh, try and fiddle around later on. So this is... Um, how I always start and I always try and square depending on how you're framing at the end you want to leave this about an inch inch and a half um, so what three three four centimeters around the edge on all sides um, because if you are framing it in the hoop that's a bad example if you are framing it in the hoop later on you will want to leave those sort of centimetres, round it up, but leave those centimetres so that you can gather all of this up at the back and draw it up. And if you're framing it in a square, you'll have a square of um, mount board and you'll need something to fold it round. So you need that extra, it doesn't need to be massively baggy, but you'll need that extra fabric just around the edge um, for when you frame it later on. Obviously there are other ways of framing it, those are my two um, ways of framing, so um, that's what I'll be thinking of in the future. So as you put it in, um, obviously this pushed down quite nicely over it, but you'll still want to try and tighten it. And if you've got space in your little hoop screw for a screwdriver, that's much easier on the hands. And today is really, really hot. It's meant to be the hottest day of the year, so I'm feeling all kind of hot and sweaty and bothered and slightly sticky, which possibly isn't the best time to be doing this. But hey ho. So. Rather than, this is a top tip, rather than pulling downwards to tighten, which is what most people would be inclined to do, it's much easier if you turn your hoop upside down, place your hands so that they're resting on the hoop, the, the inner hoop, this wooden hoop, uh, and pushing down, and then you're pulling up the calico whilst pushing down, and that makes sure you go all the way around, but that's much easier because what you have a tendency to do if you do that way is actually pull the hoops apart again, um, which I've seen happen several times. But this is now beautifully drum tight uh, and ready to go. So I have brought down a huge oof, and very heavy box of fabrics. Uh, this is just one of many. Um, I'm a bit of a hoarder it has to be said. So I hoard fabric, so I've got all sorts of bits and bobs and also people donate bits to me. So this is a bit of K-Facet cotton, which looks like it was being turned into a, a tie back maybe, or a, a handle for something, but they're such beautiful hot colors. Um, I've got all sorts of things in here. So there's loads of ideas immediately. So you could have something like this, combine it with that maybe, and that one, perhaps even a bit of that one, maybe it's too bright though, maybe go more there. And you've got like an autumn palette, so that would be one. Or you could have, and this is the palette of my most, of one I'm actually working on. Um, we've got my lovely Lewis and Irene hairs, which would go quite nicely with that. Maybe you're thinking kind of purple sunset, 
this is beautiful this is moda uh, moda ombre moda gradient and it starts out this really beautiful dark purpley color so hopefully you'll be able to see this um, and ends up this really light look at that one fabric that'll do hundreds of different stitch coats all sorts of different colors that was a well that was a bargainess bargainess buy totally justified which is now how I have to justify all my purchases. So we've got autumn, we've got kind of a dark purpley moon situation. Uh, this is a previous one. I seem to put all my fabrics away in collections of my previous stitch coats. Uh, we've kind of got a watery thing going on here. That's rather lovely. Watery, and again, my Lewis and Irene lily pads, Lewis and Irene bumbleberries. What have we got in here? So, we've got some lovely hand dyed batik. Uh, oh, I've got little bees. Bees and butterflies in purple. I've got foxes. Could do something with those. Let's see in here if we've got anything. Oh, we've got, oh, they're pretty. Daffodils. I love going through. I go to all these craft fairs and I end up buying loads and loads of fabrics. Spending hundreds of pounds that I really oughtn't but can't help myself. We could even do Christmas look if anyone's feeling slightly festive. Um, and then I bring them back and they go back in my stash collection and then I forget about them. That's K Facet, that's rather lovely. That would add to your autumn, wouldn't it, really? That could go. Uh, I wonder if that would go with the daffodils. That might go with the daffodils as well. Um, yeah, I forget about them. And then I go through my boxes. And it's like rediscovering them all over again. It's just brilliant. That might be that might be slightly the wrong blue. Maybe the bumbleberries would work. Okay, so what I'm doing here, which is what I do with all my stitch capes, usually there isn't a massive unless unless I've had a stroke of inspiration and something very particular is being created. Usually what I'll do is just go through my stash until a fabric comes to mind or a collection comes together. If you lay it all out, you can start to pull out ones that will work together. Um, and basically what you're looking for is a colour balance. So colours that work together, fabrics that work together. So for example, if I was to take the daffodils which I think I probably will, because I haven't used this fabric yet and I've been dying to, so. So, daffodils here, we've got kind of three main colours. So you've got the lovely blue of the background, you've also got the yellow petals, and you've got the uh, green of the leaves and the stems. So, what you can do then is try and say, well, I'm going to try and match this blue. So, have I got bits of blue? And it doesn't have to match exactly, otherwise it will start looking samey-samey. But if you just try and get the tone right so that could potentially go that looks quite good and this is a really scrappy scrap so we could keep that but also this bumbleberries it's kind of it's, it's darker but it's sort of along the same tone those sit quite nicely next to each other they're sort of in the same family but well, not really but sort of and this one which is just a little I think the lady, I bought this at the Ardingly Court Show, which is in the south of England, um, near where I live. And there's a lady there, and she's there every year, and I'm sure she calls these samosas. And I can never figure out how she folds them, and she just like folds them like that all the time. Um, so that kind of goes, It's it's got a nice background, sort of creamy background here, which actually matches the creamy kind of trunks of the, the daffodil flower, and this green kind of goes that could look really nice together plus it's got great ideas for stitches on it that's the other thing that I think of when I look at these fabrics is what stitches can I use so the bumbleberries which I've used previously in my water lilies I've actually gone round each of these um, little shapes uh, just with a single strand of back stitch but you could also fill some of them with satin stitch which would be really lovely or you could fill them with stripes cross hatches whatever you feel like 
This one immediately says to me pistol stitches, which are French knots on the sticks. If you can do a French knot, you can do a pistol stitch. You just do your French knot and then you put it down somewhere else uh, and it'll create a little stem from where it's travelled. But I digress. So those are already looking quite nice together. Maybe it'd be not quite nice if we could get something perhaps a little bit more yellow in it. Maybe this one could go because this is again got the blue in the spots here matches the blue of the bumbleberries little bits of yellow that we can pick up on so maybe that's quite a nice collection I will just have a rifle through because we've also got these two which are rather lovely and I think what I'll do is I'll pull out all the ones think could work and we'll have a quick tidy this is the other issue I have is that there ends up fabric everywhere no one can see anything and it all becomes a huge jumble which is a problem in my workshops actually because I just put down loads of boxes of scraps and then say go on then away you go and everyone just kind of sits there staring at the fabrics um, hoping that I'm gonna magically produce something that will tell them what they're doing so that could potentially go so could that, that's quite lovely, that's another ombre one, just a scrap of, I think that was another samosa actually, you've got to love a samosa seller. Right, so that's a huge patch, we've already done one of those, so, oh, boxes aren't, aren't going to make the cut for this one. So, quick rifle, we've got another slightly different coloured plain blue. A load of purples that's rather fabulous oh that goes nice with that one and there are just so many options and these are all just fat quarters and scraps you really don't need very much fabric for this so if you've got any kind of offcuts uh, most of these are cotton a lot of maybe christmas a lot of these are cotton fabrics but you can you I mean furnishing fabrics maybe thick upholstery you might not want to go to because you, obviously you're, you're going to be embroidering over this so you don't want to go too wild with the thickness of your um, fabrics but these are these are really nice weights so which one's this this is a Lewis and Irene flows little flowers that's rather sweet isn't it so what I like to do is to, once, once obviously you've got your, your calico in, you can see how this is ready to go, is to roll out your fabric. So this one is going to be my main one. This is my feature. It's what I want your eye to be drawn to um, when you're looking at the hoop. So probably, and actually I've just realised that is, uh, oh no, it looked like it was upside down, but I think it's actually a multi-directional. Um, what what I to do is, is roll it out, lay it out, try and get the thickness without actually cutting anything. Because uh, obviously it might be a special saved scrap like my K facet, which I don't like cutting into because obviously it's K facet. It's quite expensive. It's designer, you know, designer. Um, is to just roll them out to the thickness that you want. Fifteen centimeters. Usually I'd use about five fabrics. Um, if you're just doing like a horizontal, you can use more, you can use less, it really doesn't matter. Um, but that's sort of the length. Right, this blue, oh yes, this blue is better than that blue. Um, and hopefully you can see what I mean. And, th and this is this is all it is, it's, it's just playing. Mm, they both work though. Mm, no, I think I do prefer that one. It's just playing with fabrics, just playing with your colours. Um, and personally, I think everybody sees colour in a different way anyway. Um, having had lots of conversations with people about um, what colours are and uh, choosing colours for their own stitch scopes and they're picking up things up and going, oh, look at this lovely, lovely green and I'm going no that's definitely not green that's a blue and oh look it's lovely orange no that's not an orange um, and what I'd also do what a lot of people do is just put them straight across but 
nothing really in a landscape is completely flat there's always going to be a little bobble somewhere or a little hill somewhere so in your in your landscape it's a good idea to try and put little undulations in it just gives it a natural kind of feel about it so when you're laying your fabrics down and having a having a go at trying to visualize what it looked like try and do that in your rolls yes you've rolled it but don't do them flat 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 because it um might detract from you later on so that's quite a fun little combo there isn't it it's very stripey perhaps I need a plane oh, I've got a plane so this green let's bring the daft daffodils up this green matches beautifully with that green more so than those do so let's get rid of those two it's also a process of elimination actually that would be nice, but we're kind of up to our fabric quota here. So, last three. Could put... Mm, that's a bit more greeny. Let's just try the bumbleberries, because I like the... You can see where I've cut out before. I like the shapes of this one. Let's do a skinny one. Perhaps actually we could have more of a more of a thing in the sky. Let's perhaps go that way this time. How much space we've got at the bottom? Maybe we need something to break up between these two. So we've kind of got the rolling Yorkshire Dales coming through, and then we've had bluebells not bluebells, daffodils at the bottom. So I've already gone over what I've literally just said about the five fabrics because I'm on six already. But I think in this case, if I can try and keep that rolling, folding field effect, that would look rather lovely. Okay, let's go with that then. So before I kind of cut into things just want to talk very briefly about color balancing um, at this stage obviously this is just fabrics and the idea is that you would then put lots of embroidery threads over the top of this in lots of different colors so if it's not completely color balanced at this stage don't worry too much because you can bring colors in you can move colors up move colors down in your um, stitches and that would help balance it out so the balancing in this case, obviously, we've started from here. We've taken the yellow out completely. However, in my little stripy field thing going on here, what I could do is put in little yellow French knots. That would put your yellow back in. Green has obviously been taken on fairly well. And this green is pretty much an exact match for greens used in the bottom. And that's been kind of you know taken up to the middle you've got the blue which is now at the top and the bottom so that is quite well color balanced it looks pleasing on the eye what I mean color balance is sort of there's nothing against it that jars um, it flows uh, and, and you might want it to jar you might want to stick in a completely random color I mean maybe not red uh, in this instance I don't don't think red would work you haven't got it anywhere so um, that would look a bit odd but this this flows it looks nice so um, and what you could do is you could then take a photo which I might have done except you are on my camera uh, on my phone so uh, perhaps not um, I'll just have to try and remember what it looks like okay so perhaps the first scary part because that was meant to be this bit was meant to be fun not necessarily scary but the first scary part is actually then cutting your shapes so you've got these lovely fabrics uh, now you've got to cut them so what I'll do is just take off that chunk. Okay, so into this bit. Now, what I was saying earlier about not having a straight line also applies to cutting. If you haven't got, if you're not, if you're not thinking you're having this huge mountainous pyramid-like region, a little bit perhaps like the 
that's a mountain kit I've got and this is just in felt um, if you haven't got this huge kind of shape that you need to to play with um, you, you can have a straight line but I would recommend that you don't cut it ruler edge straight um, and I call it wiggle cutting because I love a technical term so what we're going to do is we're just going to wiggle cut this and because it's the top one if you look at all my stitch gapes previously let's see if I can get some examples okay let's go for this if you look at my stitch gapes previously I leave a bit of calico at the top and the bottom of each one and that A helps with putting them together at the back and pulling it all up but it will also um, enable you to kind of take the stitches off so it's almost like a camera lens if you've zoomed in on your camera lens and um, you've got a area of really dense focus that's kind of an idea behind these ones um, but it, it mainly it will just help you um, pull them up at the end you don't have to worry about it stretching over if you don't want to leave the calico again it doesn't matter you can take your piece is right over the edge um, it's it's your piece so whatever goes um, so there we go there's some examples of those so I'm going to in this bit do the same thing so I'm going to probably cut in a little dip here so that will enable me to go off and just secure um, secure the edge of that fabric and you need to also allow a little bit of fabric just so that you can overlap um, I don't uh, kind of put the violin or bond web or a fixative or anything like that onto the fabrics uh, mainly because they're hard to stitch through then if you've got loads of fabrics with layers and layers of glue behind them they're actually really painful to sew through um, and I'm also going to make sure again in terms of kind of framing that I've taken it off the edge uh, you will need if you've got a really tiny scrap sometimes you can fit a charm pack um, square, I don't know if I've got any, yes I do, this is some Christmas ones called Winterberry from Moda, if you've got a charm pack square and it doesn't quite fit over the edge, I mean for starters if you can cut it on the diagonal this will fit a 12 and I know I'm leaping all over the place this is sort of how I, my brain doesn't go in a straight line, um, so if you're, if you're on a, a 12 centimetre, if you've got a charm pack just need enough to sort of tuck at least down the side of your hoop um, but if, yeah, if, if you can, that's a good tip actually if you've got a, a piece that is too short but you can cut it on the bias, on the diagonal you'll immediately make it longer, it will stretch but you're not um, you're not stretching it, you're not moving it so as long as you stitch it flat it's not gonna not gonna be a bother but if you can um, make sure that you cut your fabrics so that you've left a goodly portion there. So you're down the side, which is about a centimetre, and then maybe about a centimetre, centimetre and a half on either edge. So let's just do a little bit more. Okay. So that's first one. So I have already got a little bit of a wiggle, but I haven't wiggled in the right place. So let's just continue, maybe put a little dip in, um, and I'm, I've done a few of these now, um, I'm quite comfortable just going in, cutting the fabric, seeing what happens, but you may want to, if you're not quite so sure, you may want to draw out your pieces first um, on a template, draw it out on a bit of paper first, which is absolutely fine. It's however you feel most comfortable working. Um, you could even draw, because you're not going to see this calico, you could even draw things on the calico if you needed to. So, right, bumbleberries. And that would be quite nice to try and bring this up here. So if I try and do a larger one, I did that before. Maybe if I go the other way then. So we kind of start off with a little skinny slither. Well, let's go up into a less skinny feather. There we go. 
Okay, and this I'm just roughly cutting these so I can go back and trim them as I need to. See, look, there's a nice little gap there with the edge of your hoop. So your stitch line, you'd be able to stitch up to about there. If you can see that. So you could put a little bird in using fly stitch. That's rather nice. Um, and what I'm making sure I'm doing is overlapping. Um, because what that will help do is when you tack these down, as long as you haven't used Bondaweb or Vinder Bondweb or Vyline, um, when you tack them down, if you tack from the bottom, then um, you'll immediately tack the layer above because it's all overlapped. You're not going to get things poking through um, and it's going to look much neater. Right then, so on to our third one. I've definitely used this one before. And this one is really lovely because you can stitch up each of those rows, which just looks lovely. I've used it on a Christmas hoop, I think it was. So in this case, I do want my mountain coming up this way. So I'm going to have to cut just that little bit past the hoop before I start any kind of mountainous region. Sorry about the blip there. The uh, phone rang because it just so happens to be the mother's birthday and they've all gone out and I've stayed in to film. Okay, so that looks quite nice. I like the way that that overlaps there. We've got a bit here that overlaps there. Just cut another centimetre in that bit. Right, there we go. That looks really nice. Um, and obviously something else to think about is um, what your what your pattern actually is. Um, so obviously this is a stripe, so I could have done it. I could have cut it so that my stripes went that way, which obviously perhaps would have been more landscapey. But this way kind of gives you a sense of, I don't know, bunny, bunny trails or trails. Or perhaps the farmer might have come along and cut sort of stripes in his grass is a bit like when you mow the lawn isn't it when you get one direction and another direction you end up with a stripy lawn um, so that's something else but I mean you could go completely off grid and do a wonky one so um, just be a little bit considerate when you're when you're cutting your fabrics what actually are you trying to achieve and what does the different effects does something work better in one direction than the other okay so now we're on to a lovely Lovely, lovely plain, and I think this is just a craft cotton. It's nothing fancy. I mean, I, p I pick up fabrics from all over the place, and now I've got access to trade trade supplies of fabrics. It's a really quite dangerous situation. I'm having to be reined in quite a lot because the house is just filling up with bolts of fabric when I'm getting a bit carried away. Okay, so that looks good. Just roll and, and and another re and this is this is kind of hopefully showing you how how it's good to have your calico in because you've got something in it and it's lying flat along the hoop. But I can still move it up and down and play. So we've got two more to come in here. I might need to move that up. Right, so fifth fabric. Get my little samosa triangles in. I might try and just mirror slightly that curve that we had in the, in the stripy fabric there. Yep. Okay, and obviously some people might be watching this horrified that no ironing has happened. Okay, so. A bit of this that's more up than down. It's a bit tricky to tell. Ooh, I don't know. Let's go. Let's go this way. Right. So I might try and do it so that it's way. So on the on the bottom piece. Um, and I'll just have a quick chat about layering in a second. Um, I'm going to have to cut both the top and the bottom and create a shaped piece. 
So I wonder if I can do it without deadheading anything. Mm. Well, actually, it might benefit being multi-directional as I cut this because I've cut it. I had to go up at an angle to try not to cut through the daffodil. Mm. Right, oh that's loads. Got a bit carried away there in my gardening. Let's move those off to the side. Right, so let's try doing the same. Um, and partially doing things like this where you're trying not to cut through. I mean the sheep are quite important things not to behead in my woolly dale kit. And it does actually say in the kit that you might not want to follow my templates because you want to keep the whole sheep <laughs> rather than half of a sheep. Okay, so that's a bit... Uh, that's too big. I want to feature them, but I don't want to feature them too much. And actually, I don't like the wave of the bottom. So can I make it less so? Yeah, I think so. Oops. <coughs> Okay, so this is how we're looking. So I can still play around. No, I do prefer it that way. Yeah. So I can still play around with this. Um, I'm still quite happy with the colours. Nothing's changed there. I might move that down so it's a bit more blue. We can move that up. down to a bit more of that green because that's the one that matches so nicely although these not growing very straight are they? I've got wonky daffs it's a bit better, we're kind of slanting off that way now I wonder if it would work just, uh, oh and there's the other thing uh, don't be afraid to use the back of the fabric either not, not in this case. I'm just, I'm looking at this for the shape. But you might find the fabric that you really like, but actually, it's a bit overpowering. Polka dots are a bit like that. Um, it can be quite overpowering on the back, but if you turn them over, they're much more subtle. But it does depend on the type of the print you've got. I think I prefer it with the mountain on that side. So the question is, can I cut this? To make the mountain appear on this side instead. I'll often cut my pieces slightly larger than I need to just initially so I can go back in and trim. That's that one there. That's all. Oh, no, we're going to lose the overlap. No, there we go. That's better. Yeah, that feels better. Yeah, what do you think? So at this point, once you've got all your fabrics kind of laid out, we're going to start um, to just tack this down. But first, just thought I'd show you some fun trimmings. Um, now I collect trimmings from all over the place. I get given trimmings from all over the place. Um, I particularly like kind of unusual fancy woven trimmings. Lace is a really good one. Um, but these are really fun. These are sort of a, like a, what is it really? It's just sort of folded different fibres that they've stitched down. I try and keep them all in this back. Well, some of them, this is a, just part of the collection. Um, but you could also, what I was saying about in using embroidery stitches to enhance your work and to bring things up. You could also use a trimming to put, so the yellow, we were saying we didn't have yellow, we could put yellow in here, but you could also have a yellow fence, maybe. Those are the wrong colours. That's 
very, look at that, how is that for a wave? That'd look beautiful, wouldn't it? You could definitely do a beach heart thing with that. You could have, there's a few kind of like natural hessian jute type things. That's quite an interestingly bold one. This one's really lovely. That kind of goes with our colour. I don't know, I want to use a trimming really, but maybe one of those. That's quite sweet. Keep that one. Keep that one. That's glittery. I mean, it's literally endless. This one is a green version of that orange one I just showed you. Um, I use it in nearly everything. It's just brilliant. Um, and these I'll find. Um, I think they're all from. Oh dear, no. Look back. Taking a turn for the worst. I think they're mostly from a company called Stephanois, uh, which is a French company. Let's see if it's still going to work. Which is a French company, but they do boxes of um, assorted trimmings. Um, and if you're in the UK, like me, um, you can get them in places like The Range, um, or Hobbycraft, or Little Craft Shops. If you get kind of a box and it's got assorted trimmings, they're uh, like sort of fun rick racks. Just un just, they're just unusual. Um, then it's often from the Stefan Wire company, I find. So, let's try and unwrap this one. You can obviously use more than one trimming. In a little piece, you might not want to, unless you've got something that's perhaps really delicate. So if I get this one out again, this one, I did use this lovely yellow trimming in this one. But I've also got this kind of leather cord, um, but, well, faux leather cord, um, which is quite thin. So having a couple of trimmings there doesn't really matter. And you can use yarn, wool, you can twist together whole embroidery threads, whatever you've got. It it really doesn't, doesn't matter. So I just wonder whether... Ooh, that could be fun. What if I layered? So I've got this this colour here, which I said matched this colour here, but obviously it doesn't appear anywhere else. So if I can... Uh, ooh, no, actually it does, because it appears in the stripe here. And it's quite a pale little... Now I'm thinking fences. And that's really straight. So what I would do is try to, when I stitch it, follow the line that I've cut into the fabric to try and make it less less straight. So you could put that over it as well. Or just that. Or just that. Mm. Maybe. I don't think the yellow. I think the yellow is a bit the yellow works, but it's a bit bold for my taste. It's a bit, it's sort of a bit more pastely. Um, oh, and this is a Trimits one, and Trimits is quite a good brand for um, laces and trimmings, and it does beads and all sorts. Collecting all sorts of bits and bobs here. Okay, so I think those two are potential winners, potentially even together. Because there's nothing stopping you from mixing your trimmings, mixing your threads, whatever you want to do. Um, now I said I was just going to have a quick chat about layering. So I have layered these in what I would call the traditional way. Um, you've got your sky at the top. Um, as you're looking out at a landscape, if you imagine you're standing on a ridge, you're looking at the landscape, you have your, your sky at the top and then you have bits of ground, lumps and bumps, little mountains, perhaps the hillock in front of you and the flowers you're practically standing in. And they're all coming towards you, kind of this way. So this is how it's been presented. With the sky at the back, the sky layer goes down first, your top layer, and then everything else gets subsequently layered on top of that. There are, it doesn't work in every occasion. Um, you can layer them differently. 
uh, you just have to sort of cut them differently. So what you could do is if I turned that upside down, that, I mean obviously the way I've cut this, it does immediately look upside down. But if you look at the layering, what I've done is suddenly that's like a sort of, you could have that as a really oppressive sky. If you've got, I've got this fantastic lightning print. If you've got a lightning print or clouds, um, and you want it to feel like the, the, it's really top heavy, the clouds are coming down, it could be a really rainy piece. Um, you could even be um, under the sea maybe uh, and have some sort of seaside things going on, but the waves are on top, you're right underneath the waves, they're on top, they're, they're, they're really prevalent. You could do it that way, so you'd layer the bottom piece first and layer up whatever's at the top uh, of the last fabric to go down is the most prominent, it's just how you present that. You could also kind of get an area that kind of looks like perspective. If you put down your middle layer first and then lay it up either side, then you'd still get quite a heavy sky maybe, you'd still get things coming towards you at the bottom, but your horizon line would be the furthest away. Um, which I don't think I've got an example of here. I have I have done it before in Stitchgates, but um, I'm trying to remember which one's Hedro Fizz maybe, um, but that's something to consider. If you're if you're a little bit worried about that, or you're a beginner and you're just kind of starting out, this is the traditional way to do it, and probably the easiest way to do it to give you that kind of natural landscape feel. So, quite happy with this. Um, so what we need to do is just go ahead and tack that down. So I've just I'm just using coats cotton, the sort of the stuff you put through the sewing machine basically. And just put a knot on the end. And depending on how you've layered it, you might want to tack it down in a different way. So where I've layered at the bottom, I'm gonna just do a couple of tacking stitches all along the edge or each of the visible edges of the fabric so where I'm tacking along this line I'm automatically tacking through that line as well um, so I have seen sort of some people and there's a lovely lady in my last class um, she took all of her fabrics off and then stitched them down sort of one at a time both edges which does work but if you spend ages kind of layering it all out it's exactly the way you want it you don't want to risk taking it off again or I would probably do it this way and if you can leave bits of the hoop um, resting on the surface the, the, the fabric shouldn't go anywhere but just in case they do um, the other thing too which I can't do because of the camera angle is to slide it off the edge of the table keep half of your hoop on the table and just use the gap between you and the table to um, keep your hand on it and I am I am putting my hand on this I'm pulling slightly pulling and stretching and just flattening out these fabrics as I go because um, I don't want to stitch in the bubbles having said that I don't iron I don't particularly want to stitch in the folds and make it tricky for me to stitch later on so I'm smoothing out as I go and I am just going, carrying the thread across the back. These are tacking stitches, they don't have to be pretty. Um, I do them in white, but it doesn't matter. If you've got a fuchsia colour, then use a fuchsia colour. They come out at the end, basically. Um, so I'm going now all the way along. They're not neat, they're not pretty. They're literally just stitching down. Um, and actually, in a minute, I'm going to run out of thread because I didn't put enough in this one. It was just what was on the needle already. So what I do, as I've run out of thread there, is pull it all the way through, pull my needle off, and just temporarily leave it. I will come back and just knot that off at the back later, but I don't want to risk turning my hoop up the other way. And I think this needle was really hard to thread earlier because it slightly bent and twists isn't it? I'm just going to go okay so back again so 
So I'm just dashed my new thread and I'm just going for it basically. Oops. You can if you're <clears throat> if you're wanting to do pieces where perhaps you've got a tree coming up of it or you've fussy cut around a shape, maybe a bird or a bush. I would stitch this down so I often get asked that in my classes if, if you've got something that you will want on the top later on um, that you've cut out of your fabric but you're not necessarily going to be stitching it until later I would still put that on because you don't want to be working your lovely beautiful stitches into your fabric only to then discover that actually they stick underneath um, your tree or your bush uh, and suddenly your bush doesn't lie flat or your, your tree's got lumps in it so if you stitch down I mean you can you can stitch down all of this way and now I could decide oh actually I'd quite like a tree but because I haven't done any kind of embroidery on it it's still all very flat the tucking stitches aren't going to affect it so I can still put down a tree at this stage. So I would stitch down anything that you're putting down in fabric um, at this stage. Okay, and I might have to speed this bit up for you. Otherwise it could get quite boring watching me just sit in here tuck. Down. none of them are going anywhere they're all overlapping this one is just overlapping that's the join between the two hoops there so we've got just a tiny little bit of an overlap there that should be okay so I'm now going to just tie off these threads see if I can get my needle on there a little tiny spindly needle against this fairly chunky calico is probably not the best. Okay. And I'm just putting a little knot. So I've just taken my, because it can be quite tricky working with the hoop, I've just taken my thread away from the edge of the hoop from where it was and just nipped it under the calico and just done a couple of little tiny knots there just to hold that. Again, all of, these are coming out... Um, once I've finished embroidering, so. And if you can, get a needle that easier to thread, there we go. This one I found somewhere, it stabbed me in the thumb earlier on. Um, and I've bent it. Although it put a hole in me, so there's only fair, I suppose. I'm just taking this underneath the calico. It's not actually coming through the layers of fabric on the front. Just under the calico. So I make a loop. Oops, the loops there. And just pull that through just to hold it. Once you start sewing anyway, it doesn't really matter. So, and in the process of sewing that, then there, uh, the calico has become slightly um, looser. So periodically, as you, as you stitch through, where you're holding it and handling it and pulling on it, tugging your thread and needle through, you just wanna kind of keep keeping that nice and tight because keeping that tight will help you um, to push out any of the bubbles. You can kind of already see, it doesn't really matter that I haven't ironed. Where it's been stretched and tacked, um, the, the lines and crinkles and creases are already starting to come out. So this one, if you pull on it, it'll go. So as, you, as I stitch that, I will probably be pulling on this side just to push it out um, which brings me to another point obviously I will leave it like this as I sew so that I can iron out 
all those crinkles with stitches um, and pull on it I've still got the ability to kind of move it if I want to create a bubble I can push it in if I don't want to create a bubble which is usually the case and um, pull it out again uh, but what you can do if you're not confident on where your hoop is obviously you can if you're if you're looking for the edge of the hoop you can kind of mark it with a nail and um, some people will also once they've done it just on the back will also stitch another kind of row of tacking stitches all the way around the edge just underneath so when you're looking at it on the front you know where your stitch line is you know how far up you can go what you can do is also obviously take this outer hoop off take it off completely and push it back over everything as you push it down you'll be stretching out these um, fabrics anyway and you need to make sure then that you haven't got any bubbles in it that everything is being pulled out um, and then you can quite clearly see the image that you're trying to create then um, but it's just personal preference to me to leave it um, leave it loose and out like that um, and obviously if you're doing trimmings and things you might want to leave those hanging out the sides as well just until you come to frame it uh, you don't want to have if you are going to frame it in your hoop you don't want to have really really chunky um, trimmings because it, it'll affect you when you try and um, frame it later on and put it all in the hoop later on because you'll have gaps down the sides your fabrics might not pull through so nicely um, so just bear that in mind um, when you're doing kind of trimmings you don't want to layer them up too much or perhaps at the edge you allow them to come side by side just a little little thing to consider um, so I'll perhaps think about trimmings on those slightly later on so if I very quickly just kind of repeat a couple of bits so this is on my 12 centimetre or my 5 inch depending which form of measurement you prefer so kind of lining that up Pushing that over, I mean, they're really easy, so it's not very tight at all. And this is on the slightly thinner calico. I find that once it's in, the, the, the weight of the calico doesn't really make that much of a difference. It's literally just an additional support for your gorgeous, wonderful patterned fabrics. Okay, I should really be screwdrivering that, but there we go. Um, so, having made a mess with all of, all of those, I wonder if I can quickly do quite a stormy, maybe even a snowy sky. Ooh, the possibilities, as always, are endless. Maybe if I try to do a grey, a oh, grey scale one, perhaps. What have we got? Have we got? this piece maybe not a grey scale maybe like a blue and grey sort of like scandy style um, so as your hoops get smaller you might want to start using less and less fabrics because um, you want it to look super busy perhaps a sky and a snow scene I've said sort of a moment there because that's like snow isn't it that's quite pretty so then then what perhaps if I do this lovely this is um I'm shouting out brand names at you but uh, this is a brand called Macawa this one uh, this is their linear pattern which comes in a variety of colours and is actually, I've got it in several colours and it's brilliant because uh, you can, it's got these lines and you can choose to kind of you, uh, stitch, back stitch or stem stitch or some kind of skinny um, line stitch uh, and just go up um, like in my ladybugs or you could just go horizontal, pick out those lines um, or do both, do a cross hatch but they're kind of wiggly and I really love the wiggle Okay, so we have our, hmm, I quite liked the dark sky, maybe do that then. So we've got those, we've got anything in here, that's stripey. Mm, maybe that one. 
I'm trying to mix up different patterns basically. You can obviously do it all in plain or all in stripe or I don't know, all in polka dot. Polka dots are actually really easy to kind of change around and make them into other things because you can join between the dots, um, a bit like the linear, you can join between the dots and um, make horizontal, you can join between the dots and make a, a vertical, you can join between the dots and make a diagonal, or you can go multi-directional, make a grid square, you can make a diamond square, or you could just keep them as a polka dot um, and fill in the spots with satin stitches depending on the size of the spot. You could do a French knot or a colonial knot. I mean, literally, whatever, whatever you fancy. So I've kind of got a stormy snow sky, would you say? I think, maybe. Perhaps he could be a little sort of like rocky. There's a lady in my last class and um, she really wasn't very confident. Um, and didn't sort of, she wasn't believing in what she was doing, um, which you get occasionally, but it's quite hard to kind of work around people who don't believe in what they're doing. And she was um, inspired by my Lionel's Lighthouse stitch gate, which she had a picture of in front of her, and she was sort of trying to copy it, which is fine. Um, in workshops, I don't mind she copying. Uh, although, Obviously, I do mind copying if it's then you go on and try and sell it as your own idea. But in workshop situations and for private use, it doesn't doesn't really bother me. Um, and she ended up kind of following my instructions, but sort of putting bits and every bit she liked was all these sort of like little scrap samples, and um, they weren't quite big enough. And she had to kind of not cut them, she just sort of started stitching them down in squares. But she was trying to sort of recreate the waves and all that sort of thing. And ended up kind of ripping it all off and I had to go in and kind of help her. But she did at the bottom. Most fantastic kind of rocky selection, just using bits that she'd cut off. All these, all these little tiny scraps, she kind of circled them, made them into clumps. She had bits of them um, trimming on there. And and she was, didn't seem confident about it at all, and I loved it. Um, what are we doing? Snowy at the top, maybe, kind of coming down to... Um, and I was thinking, oh, perhaps I ought to go back and do Lionel and just try and see if I can recreate it, but I don't know that I can. But she was just... It's really hard, because it was, it was so... It looked so lovely. But one, I think once you get yourself into that kind of, it's no good, it's no good, I'm not going to be as good as a tutor or whatever. I mean, I've got years of experience and I still do stuff and I absolutely hate it. Um, or I sort of feel very uncomfortable. But what one person doesn't like, another person does. I'm always amazed. The ones that I, the pieces that I do, that I'm like, oh, this is, this is not good. I hate this. I don't like this. This could have been better. That could have been better. Someone else comes up and goes, my God, this is amazing. This is my favourite. You're going, really? Are you sure? So you've, it's really kind of, you know, personal taste on it. Right, so I wonder if what I can do some sort of bizarre little rocky formations. This is probably too big. Uh, oh no. And just kind of get, because I can go over this, if you're sort of doing a snowy scene. Mm, yeah, it's not too bad. If you're trying to do a snowy scene, I can carry these little spots up into here, if I needed to. With French knots, as I sort of just said. Use use white, do French knots, or I could do French knots all over here, so there's like snow drifts coming down. Maybe kind of build in with bullion knots, other sorts of knots. Perhaps even just tufts of white. I might have some white threads somewhere. Um, any kind of like white roving, felt roving, just to make it kind of cotton wool buds, anything. Um, to make it look a little bit snowy. That's, I should really fold these up neatly. I always end up with such a mess to tidy up at the end. Right, and I love this print. I've no idea what it is. Um, 
If I know what they are, I'll try and tell you, but um, I've absolutely no idea what this is or even where it came from. Um, so I'm afraid I can't be very helpful. So I haven't got a lot of room. So let's go up there. But where I've got, kind of got this up and down here, I might try and do an up and down that's at odds with it. So go up more in the... In the middle, maybe. Put little peaks on it. Let's have a look. What does this look like? And mm. because um, it's the bottom one, and I'm going to do the traditional, probably, well, 98% of my stitch gates will be done in the traditional layering way that we've just discussed. Fun, isn't it? Although I'm just a bit concerned where I've, I'd have to do the edging on this one and the edging on that one. The edging is would kind of mush together. So perhaps if I just bring that down and then go up, that would that's better. Okay. So there's another one, and again, you could have, uh, I don't think I had any in that bag. Oh, we could even. The one I said was wavy. I don't think it's the right colour. It's not quite the right navy. I can't even find the end. There we are. Oh, there we go. Like that go. Ooh. Oh, that's nice. Or I like that. That helps with the colour balancing as well. You just got a little bit of dark which picks up on this beautiful sort of dusky, it was a bit of a dusty blue really, dusty navy. But then all the white and the creams that come down here and it's kind of a, that's the edge of the dark looming cloud and this is the start of the blue snowy cloud. Oh, this, this bit is now upsetting me. Perhaps this needs to be a bit more. I mean, I'm just going in, I'm just cutting, I have absolutely no idea, it's just kind of, that's a bit better, yeah, yeah, okay. So on this, I mean, you can imagine, you could get some like quite chunky little beads down the bottom here and put little reeds coming off, and there's nothing stopping you, if you're trying to do rocks, there's nothing stopping you from getting some bits of felt or, um, wadding or curtain interlining or quilt batting, anything, even kitchen roll. I've stuffed rocks with kitchen roll before because so we didn't have anything else. I was in a workshop and I hadn't I hadn't taken anything. She said, oh, I want, would like padded rocks in my Australian outback. I said, okay. Um, went to the toilet and ripped up a load of toilet tissue so it was kind of a bit puffy and just stuffed it in. Um, but there's nothing stopping you from putting a layer of wadding underneath this and actually bringing those out because as you stitch through you're creating that kind of quilted quilted effect so there's there's there is no right or wrong is that going to look too overpowering do you think hmm. no i don't think so i think to balance it's quite heavy in the sky but we want the sky to look kind of heavy i mean i could always Oh, well, that's a different ball game entirely. Let's try that. And play around before you commit yourself to anything, before you stitch anything down. Play around with it. So I've just said about the looming sky, and I'm not being very experimental myself here, am I? So if I brought that down, had that bit as a what do you think of that? Hmm. I don't know that you'd still want that bit, would you? No, maybe not. Look 
Okay, should I put it under here? I mean, trimming is also good because where you've got all these raw edges, um, I would generally stitch all of this inside, whatever it is I'm doing in here, seed stitch or whatever, which builds up great texture in rocks actually, seed stitch. Um, I would do all of my filling stitches and then do something on the edge just because as I do my filling stitches I can then take those stitches over that edge and just support it um, to stop it fraying. So when I come along to work on the edge and all of my edges, if I'm edging this fabric I will work my edging fabric on this, my edging stitch sorry, on this fabric so it's not even on that one but then roll it over in some way, move it over in some way. Obviously if you've got a trimming you don't even have to do that, you just put your trimming over. But I'd always try and stitch, if you're working really closely to an edge, always try and stitch on the layer below the one that you're actually stitching on. The problem is, is if I do it there, then I've got a funny bit in my rock. Mm, no, I think we're going to have to go back and do it traditional way. Just have a bit more, a bit more of it maybe. Where's my... Overlappy edge, maybe overlappy edge. Overlap there, overlap there. I've got my rocks. Okay, let's go back to that. So, where I've got this then, this then creates it kind of looking a little bit top heavy. So, whatever I do down here is going to have to be fairly bold. So, even if it's just using um, three or four strands of your embroidery thread, so I'll use stranded embroidery threads and um, strip them down. Traditionally most of most of my stitches are done using only two strands uh, or even one strand if you're trying to create more of a delicate line. So for example this one, uh, this would have been two strands, all my bullion knots were two strands, my french knots were two strands, two strands in the sun, two, um, two strands in these french knots. But this one is a darker colour, it's meant to look kind of slightly skinny, that's only a single strand. These ones where they overlap each other, this is split stitch down the bottom here. Uh, this is only one strand because I'm going over and over it. Seed strand in one stitch, back stitch in one. Um, kind of, they are all kind of one or one or two strands. But if you want them to look really chunky, you can either use like a cotton perlate, slightly thicker thread, or you can use four or five at a time. If you're going really chunky, which I might not do because um, it's a bit fluffy. This is actually um, acrylic double knit yarn, Stylecraft special DK yarn to be exact, um, which comes with kind of three strands twisted together and I will usually split it down and use either one strand or two strands because uh, then it will fit through your needle. So these are the two strands. Uh, in French knots, which are probably, mm, see if I can remember, about five twists, five twists around your needle for your French knots, whereas these ones are only using the one strand. But actually, if you imagine those in green, not in green, in grey, coming up here, those are really chunky, they're really bold, they stand out proud, so actually that could look really nice. And that would help balance the weight of using this in the sky to make the rocks come forward. Yeah, I quite like that. Let's go with that. So we're going to commit this to, I hope, we're going to have to thread a bit more. Okay. So again, I'm going to come up from the bottom first because then I can start to trap and again I've, I've left the calico visible at the bottom and at the top and I quite like the calico although it is being used mainly as a base fabric I sort of like to nod to the fact that it is still there it is still part of it so it's sort of just peeping through And I think I'd probably have to speed this bit up for you as well.
I'd probably do with the trimming is actually use embroidery thread and properly stitch it down straight off rather than actually tacking that down. Some trimmings, if they're kind of um, larger, you might want to just tack down, or if they're tucking underneath and folding over, you might want to tack them down. But this one, now these are down, I'll actually just go through and stitch it um, and make sure it's all lined up as I go. Quick work's really lovely actually because you can do so many different things on it. If you search on Pinterest for different rick rack ways of um, decorating it. It's actually very versatile. Um, so there we go. So that's two, let's bring this one up, two stitch gates, two new stitch gates kind of created here with lots of different ideas on things to do. Um, in terms of stitches you could do seed stitch, you could do fly stitch in each of these little um, pointy bits that would lend itself really well, what I was saying earlier about the linear. Um, you could do stem stitch, running stitch, back stitch, um, whipped stitch, whatever you like, um, along that worm, French knots perhaps in that one, maybe filling the larger one just for a different texture, um, seed stitch perhaps with a couple of them, um, with only one strand because it's higher than a seed stitch, if I did it down here I'd probably use three or four strands to make it chunky, cover all of that with French knots as well, I tend to layer my stitches, much like you've layered your fabric, I tend to layer your stitches, use different ones, um, just play around. How can, how can you create certain textures? How do you um, how do you make it look like the um, item that you're actually trying to uh, create? Or what kind of feeling does it give you? Do you want it to be fluffy? Do you want it to be hard? Um, you could use beads in this, just for little bits of sparkles. As it's meant to be snow, you could use lustrous threads, silky threads, metallic threads. Maybe just a little bit of um, a sparkly white, um, sort of DMC metallic. Or, or even a silver down the bottom, just to kind of highlight a little bit um, of that snow being shiny. Um, this one you could you could fill each of these petals either with um, a detached chain stitch to make it a little bit more daisy-like maybe, or again fill those three strands of um, three strands of uh, the stranded cotton, maybe three stitches in each that would fill that. Maybe a French knot in the middle of each one. Uh, you could follow those. You don't have to follow any of it. The, the beauty of using pre-patterned fabric is that you don't actually have to fill it all in if you don't want to. As long as it's secured down with some form of stitching and you can do whatever you like. Um, as I said before, pistol stitches, you could do running stitch along here, um, following the line um, of this, this fabric, but do your running stitches in the plain green. Maybe with some French knots to try and bed that bit in a bit so that it's not so harsher, harsher defined line. You could use stripes there. I could do what I said earlier, f go round these, fill them in. Uh, you could do whatever you like, seed stitch again. There are certain stitches that I will use over and over and over again. And if you find one that works for you and you know what textures it creates, then by all means use it again and again. But equally have a look online, see if there are other stitches. Uh, and just have a play you might create your own stitches who knows um so anyway i hope you have uh, enjoyed this little uh, kind of putting together of um the stitch capes and hopefully it gives you a couple of ideas and on ways things to look out for if you're creating your own uh, and just a little bit of confidence so uh hope you enjoyed leave me a comment below if uh, you think i haven't answered any questions or if any questions have arisen that you um would like me to answer and i'll do my best um other than that thanks for watching Thank you.